Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 379th episode, we've got a bunch of news. I think you've got a new dinosaur, right? Yeah, and a new abelosaur. Those are cool. And I've got a sauropod. The really weird role reversal we've got going on. <laughs> <laughs> we also have an interview with Rebecca Hunt Foster from Dinosaur National Monument. Mm-hmm. So you can guess what we talked about. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Guaibasaurus. It's a dinosaur from Brazil, so we're going with the Portuguese pronunciation. Yeah, it's spelled G-U-A-I-Basaurus, if you can't tell by how we're pronouncing it. <laughs> but before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have a new patron to thank, and that's Sauropod Susan. Thank you very much, Sauropod Susan, for joining our Patreon. And then rounding out our shoutouts, we've got Bradley, TRX Dinosaurs, Chris, Jeff, Randy and Squim, Colton, and Kylo Solis, Gabe, and John Heck. I love hearing all these names. Thank you so much to everyone for supporting our show and being dinosaur enthusiasts with us. And jumping into the news, I get to start because it's about a new dinosaur. I was telling Garrett, sometimes I pick these news items so I can go first. <laughs> yeah, that is the rule. <laughs> if you have a new dinosaur, you get to go first, that's for sure. It's a toss-up when we both end up covering new dinosaurs, though. Yeah, then we, it, yeah, it kind of depends. Sometimes we do the more exciting one first, sometimes we do it second. Yeah. I don't know. Well, back to this one. It's an abelosaurid, so a theropod, from the late Cretaceous of northwestern Argentina. So maybe around the same time as Carnotaurus, although farther northwest maybe yeah well this one i think lived a little bit before carnotaurus because carnotaurus was maastrichtian like roughly 70 ish million years ago yeah and this one's campanian so maybe 72 million years or older gotcha the name of the dinosaur is guemesia ochoai it was published about in the journal of vertebrate paleontology by federico agnolin and others and the genus name, Guemesia, is in honor of General Martin Miguel de Guemes, quote, who was both governor and a military leader who defended northwestern Argentina during the War of Independence, end quote. The species name is in honor of Javier Ochoa, a technician of the Regional Museum Florentino Ameghino, quote, who has worked extensively in Cretaceous outcrops of northwestern Argentina and discovered the specimen here described, end quote. So as I mentioned, it's an abelosaur, Guemesia, that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Salta Province, Argentina. It was found in the Los Blanquitos Formation in reddish sandy siltstones. It is hard to tell what this dinosaur looked like, and actually the art that came along with a lot of the articles was of Carnotaurus. Yeah, I noticed that, which is kind of weird. But that's because right now all that's been found is a small, nearly complete brain case as the holotype. Yeah, that's not a lot to go on for paleo art. A little top back of the head, basically. Mm -hmm. There's some compression there. There's some evidence of pre-burial cracking, but they CT scanned the fossil and they found enough features to know that it's an abelosaur and a new abelosaur at that. The skull roof is nearly flat and it had a low sagittal crest that ridge a bone along the midline of the top of the skull. There were no bumps or horn-like projections. Oh, so not like Carnotaurus. Yeah. But it did have these small holes in the front of the skull, which might have helped it cool down, like a thin skin at the front of the skull, and then blood pumped into it and released heat. Gotcha. That reminds me a lot of dinosaurs. We see those pores in the bone, and then we assume that it was full of blood vessels because it's pretty much the main thing that goes through bone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so why else would they be doing that? Unless they wanted to blush or do something else, supply some huge fleshy thing to the on top the of the head top of the head yeah yeah like a snood on a turkey <laughs> he can yeah I, I don't think that's the case here but yeah it's yeah. less likely for sure <laughs> it did have skull traits like abelosaurids like a heavily ornamented skull roof basically it was rugose it also has plesiomorphic features or ancestral features of abelosaurids such as that thin skull roof and not having skull projections like those horns or bulges at the moment, they're saying that Guimasia is a basal abelosaurid, but we need more fossils to know for sure. So basically, since it doesn't have horns like Carnotaurus and later abelosaurids, 
it seems more basal. It's interesting they consider the frontals to be heavily ornamented when it's missing the one ornament that everyone would recognize on a, an abelisaurid. Yeah, I had to mention grooves. Yeah, it was probably important to the other guamasia running around. And the brain case that they found was small compared to other abelisaurids. So it's unclear if this specimen was a juvenile or not. And that's because there's no other bones we could really use to do histology. Yeah, you can't really cut into a brain case and find anything useful because they get remodeled so much. Because like even the brain shape changes in dinosaurs a lot. And then you've got, you know, the ornamentation changing and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to get remodeled so much. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have lags to use. The cranial endocast, though, is almost 70% smaller than the cranial endocast of relatives like Carnotaurus and Via Venator. That's a lot smaller. Yeah. There's a strong fusion of some of the bones in the brain case, so maybe this is an adult or a subadult, but the authors said, quote, caution is needed when using bone fusion as a maturity proxy, end quote. Yeah. Especially in the head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... At least this specimen was small. It's one of the smallest known abelosaurids. You know, it's smaller than medium-sized abelosaurids like Scorpio venator or Via venator. And those abelosaurids range from about 13 to 20 feet or 4 to 6 meters long and weighed about one and a half tons, give or take. So it's smaller than that. Probably a lot smaller. Oh, it was a lot smaller, you said, than Carnotaurus. And Via venator. So, Yes. So even if the full-grown one wasn't that much smaller, at least this individual was very small. Yes. And that helps to show that abelosaurs may have had more variation in size than we previously thought. Though, again, it's possible that this particular specimen of Guimesia is a juvenile. It's just unclear at the moment. But it does help show that dinosaurs in this area were different from other parts of what is now Argentina. Like Carnotaurus. Exactly. Now, abelosaurs are usually known from Patagonia not northwestern Argentina. Most abelosaurids from northwestern Argentina, they're incomplete. There's isolated bones and teeth. But there's 35 dinosaur taxa from the Cretaceous of Patagonia, and a lot of them are abelosaurs. Hmm. I'm surprised there aren't more, actually. I thought there'd be enough titanosaur, like that many titanosaurs alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does seem like we talk about Patagonia a lot. But then not many theropod fossils have been found in northwestern Argentina. They mostly came before this from a noosaurid the Noosaurus from the Lecho Formation in Salta Province. <laughs> the Noosaurid Noosaurus. Yes. <laughs> That's a pretty important one. The clade Abelosauroidea has two main groups, Abelosauridae, which tend to be the medium to large size and bulky animals, and Noosauridae, which tend to be the small size and more gracile animals. So there is some variation, depending on what kind of Abelosaur you're talking about. And then, of course, abelosaurids are known for their short arms. They're even shorter than T-Rex. They couldn't even really use their arms. They're so short. So based on that, we have a kind of a general idea of what Guamasia would have looked like. Now, other fossils found in the same formation as Guamasia include the Manoraptoran theropod, Unchiosaurus, and Titanosaurian sauropods. Those titanosaurs are everywhere. Hopefully, eventually, more fossils will be found of Guimazia. That'll help figure out the size and then whether or not this particular specimen is juvenile. Yeah, it'd be good to know. It'd be especially nice if we could find more bones from this specific individual so the holotype isn't just one brain case. True. <laughs> but I suppose if they find a really good skeleton or something, it might become a neotype, or this one might get nomen dubiumed, depending on how many we find. And if you find the part of the brain case that you can compare and you know, oh, this is the same species. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it would probably only get nomen dubiumed if we found multiple abelosaurids that had that same brain case, but had differences in other parts of the body. And it's like, well, that could be anything. Mm -hmm. Then it gets the X. So now I've got a sauropod paper to talk about. All right. I've been waiting to talk about this one for about two years. <laughs> we first learned about it at SVP in 2020. And when I read it, I had, I remember I asked you, like, did you just cover this? This is really familiar. And then I had to go back through. I was like, maybe it was at SVP. I found it. But it was embargoed, so we couldn't talk about it back then. But it's really interesting. So it's about a respiratory infection in a sauropod. And it's actually the first evidence ever of a respiratory infection in a sauropod. 
It was published in Scientific Reports and written by Carrie Woodruff and others. The headlines for this were pretty great, too, like, Sorrow Throat. <laughs> That's pretty good. And Achoo. Because <laughs> it's sneezing? It's a respiratory illness. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought there was a pun there that I was missing. Oh, no. The first one was a pun, but the second one was just a reference. So for a little bit of background, this sauropod in question is Dolly. That's the nickname. It's at the Museum of the Rockies. Dolly was found back in 1990 in the Morrison Formation, which you probably are familiar with. It's got all sorts of very famous dinosaurs, especially sauropods. It's where your favorite is from. Mm-hmm. And also, oh, I'm familiar. <laughs> yeah. And also Diplodocus and Stegosaurus and all sorts of cool dinosaurs are from the Morrison in the late Jurassic. They found Dolly's skull back in 1990 and the first seven neck vertebrae in a row. So it's a nice little articulated end of the neck. And the end of the neck and head that we usually don't find or often don't find, I should say. Later, they found some more bones, but they aren't really relevant to the study other than the fact that they don't seem to have the same problem. Hmm. <laughs> so it helps to show that this problem that Dolly was suffering from was localized to one part of the neck. Dolly's considered to be a diplodocid, or diplodocid, if you prefer. The authors used diplodocus for their drawings, but it technically, I guess, could be another diplodocid. They didn't get into it more than that. It's not super important since we're talking about a paleopathology, and no matter which diplodocid it is, it's going to affect it the same kind of way. Mm -hmm. But in any event, it had a very long neck, not as long as Mementosaurus. That's hard to beat. <laughs> it is, but you could think maybe like 10 plus meters or 30 feet sort of range for massive sauropod neck. They found that three of the vertebrae in Dolly's neck had, quote unquote, broccoli shaped growths. Ooh. <laughs> we have Riley Black to thank for the broccoli shaped analogy. I really enjoyed that one. Mm -hmm. It also kind of looks like a sea sponge or something like that. It's just like your typical tumory looking growth with lots of little bumps on it. Poor Dolly. Yeah, it's it's also an osteomyelitis, which we talk about a lot. Those mm -hmm. gross on bones. So in terms of dinosaur respiration, I think we've talked about this before, but dinosaurs use unidirectional respiration. In other words, bird-like breathing. So the title of the paper is that it's the first occurrence of an avian-style respiratory infection in a non-avian dinosaur. Hmm. Started early. Yes. Because we do have evidence, obviously, of respiratory infections in dinosaurs. If you include birds today, we see them all the time. But non-avian dinosaurs, not so much. The way that birds and almost certainly dinosaurs respire or breathe is through their air sacs. When they breathe in, they fill most of the air sacs. And when they breathe out, they empty most of the air sacs. But the lungs are rigid and always have air in them. So in that way, they are more efficient in terms of like permanently exchanging oxygen with their bloodstream. And it allows things like sauropods probably to breathe because otherwise, if they did tidal breathing like we do where we breathe in and their, fill our lungs. Their necks are too long. Yeah, because when they breathe out, they would go a long time without oxygen, with that whole exhalation and then breathing in, you know, there would be not a whole lot of oxygen exchange time in the lung. But they can get around that by this fancy use of air sacs. So they CT scanned two of the vertebrae that had these broccoli-like <laughs> growths on them. And they turned out to be the two closest to the shoulders of that original series. Although it looks like later they found some more vertebrae closer to the shoulders that don't have these growths on them because sauropods have way more than just seven vertebrae in their necks. Mm -hmm. The most simple explanation is that Dolly had air sacculitis. Well, that doesn't sound good. It isn't. Itis always means inflammation, or at least it should always mean inflammation. That's what it means in Latin. Inflammation of any body part is usually a symptom of something else, like an infection or a disease. Pretty much anything in our body can get inflamed, so there is an itis associated with just about every Latin part of our body. So, for example, gastroenteritis is the inflammation of the stomach and intestine. There's pancreatitis, which is pancreas inflammation, and there's even encephalitis, 
which is brain inflammation. That sounds like a particularly nasty one. Yeah, there's a thing called Japanese encephalitis, where if you're going into more remote areas in Japan, you should get vaccinated for that before you go because you don't want your brain to swell. It's a pretty unpleasant thing to happen. There's also dermatitis, inflammation in the skin, which I get if I touch poison ivy or mango skin because mango skin contains a closely related chemical. You've seen this happen to my lips when they get all covered in blisters Mm -hmm. from too much mango content. Bronchitis is an inflammation of the bronchial tubes in the lungs, which is where air flows into our lungs, the bronchial tubes. And bronchitis is most often caused by respiratory infections. Air sacculitis is pretty similar to bronchitis, except that it occurs in bird air sacs rather than in their bronchial tubes. The name makes sense. Yep. It looks kind of crazy when it's written because it's just air sac, but with two C's (laughs) and then (laughs) eulitis. The first time I read that, I was like, what is that? And then I looked it up and it's like, oh, it's air sac (laughs) eulitis. It's just all smashed together. It's actually a really common problem in birds, just like how bronchitis is considered very common in humans. Roughly 1% of Americans get bronchitis every year. Like with our bronchi, all the air birds breathe goes through their air sacs. So as a result, inflammation of their air passages affects birds in a pretty similar way to how bronchitis affects us. They tend to cough, get tired, have difficulty breathing, and lose their appetite, which can lead to weight loss and all sorts of other problems. Even though we don't have air sacs, birds can still infect people when they're sick because air sacculitis isn't a disease, it's a symptom of usually an infection. For example, if they have an infection in their air sacs, it can sometimes spread to humans and cause bronchitis or other problems, just depending on where that infection or where that harmful bacteria reaches our body. Sometimes air sacculitis can be spotted with the naked eye on birds because their neck can get swollen if the air sacs at the base of their neck get really swollen underneath from the air sacculitis, which is something with humans you can't tell if you have bronchitis by looking at our body because our lungs are too deep. But with birds, you can actually see their air sacs when they get really inflamed. You can't always see it, though. Dolly's air sacculitis was most likely caused by breathing a bacteria or fungus. Over time, the infection got bad enough in the air sacs that it spread to the bones. Oh, no. And that's where we got the osteomyelitis. That's another itis. That means bone swelling. Poor Dolly. Yeah, it's, it's not good when you get osteomyelitis. Although, since the osteomyelitis is the only thing that's preserved, it's possible that that bone inflammation was caused by something other than a respiratory infection. The end result's still bad. It is, yeah. Anytime you have osteomyelitis in a dinosaur, it's it shows you that it had some serious problems going on. But because the infection seems localized in a few neck vertebrae, osteomyelitis caused by air sacculitis seems like the simplest explanation. If we want to get a little bit more speculative of what caused that air sacculitis, we're sort of getting to like three degrees of separation, The Western Interior Seaway, near where Dolly lived, would have been warm and damp, which is a good place for fungus to grow. Mm -hmm. So Dolly could have had a aspergillosis infection, which is caused by a fungal infection, and we see it in birds at times. However, in birds, it doesn't biomineralize. It doesn't cause osteomyelitis in birds. But it can in humans, Hmm. in cases where humans have been infected by this fungus. The earliest record of aspergillosis is about 40 to 50 million years ago. And in birds, if they get infected with this fungus, it's almost always lethal unless they get treatment. Fungal infections are rough. Yeah, definitely. So if Dolly had gotten this aspergillosis, it's likely that that would have been the cause of death. But even if it wasn't the cause of death directly, the osteomyelitis probably would have weakened it and it would have been a target for predators. So it could have indirectly caused its death. Yeah. Any kind of pathology for dinosaurs makes them a target. Yes, definitely. For any animal, really. Yeah. (laughs) So they might get 
a little bit behind the herd if they're in a herd or if they're alone then they just are moving a little slower and the predators are very attuned to noticing these differences Mm -hmm. they also included paleo art of dolly where it's coughing and it has a runny nose oh and i think there's also a bunch of flies around its head oh it's a little bit hard to tell although otherwise it looks pretty normal i could see though a predator would probably notice these details Mm -hmm. the authors wrote quote Note that the pulmonary disease infecting this animal would not have been externally evident, but the probable pneumonia-like outward symptoms would have included coughing, labored breathing, nasal discharge, fever, and weight loss, among others. That's a lot of symptoms. Yes. And obviously, in an advanced stage, it could be extra skinny after that weight loss, which again would be easy for predators to notice. And, yeah, possibly fatal. There was also a question back in 2020 in SVP where this was first presented about how long an animal would have been sick to produce these sorts of osteomyelitis modifications to the vertebrae. And they said diseases that cause bone growth can grow at different rates. So, for example, if it was cancerous, it could be a shorter time period. But since they don't see any remodeling, it could have been in the 6 to 12 month time frame. That's a long time to be suffering. Yes. And but it might have started out not so bad and then mm. sort of exacerbated over time. So that's Dolly. Yep. That's why there were all those headlines. Poor Dolly. Yeah. In happier news, as promised, going back to the Museum of the Rockies in Montana, they're hosting Dinosaurs in M.O.R., It's an event that they're going to have paleontologists come to speak on sauropods, extinction, the Hell Creek Formation, all kinds of stuff. And there will also be some paleo art classes. So if you're in the area, that event is happening April 1st and 2nd. And I guess maybe you can see Dolly. The Milwaukee Public Museum also has a new exhibit, Tyrannosaurs Meet the Family. You can see a T-Rex face-to-face, as well as specimens from China, like Guanlong. There's more than 10 life-size dinosaur specimens and a lot of tyrannosaur fossils. Nice. Makes sense. It's called Tyrannosaurs Meet the Family. There's also some kind of VR experience with dinosaurs, but I don't know the details. And that exhibit is going on from now until May 18th. And then last, the trailer for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse Madness movie for Marvel fans shows Doctor Strange battling with Marvel dinosaurs. And apparently dinosaurs have been part of the Marvel comics since the 1940s. There's one superhero, Kazar, a.k.a. David Rand, who got stranded in the jungle when the plane with his family crashed and he learned to survive. And that comic is Savage Land, Kazar. And there are dinosaurs in Savage Land, I presume. Lots of dinosaurs. (laughs) And it looks like other prehistoric animals. The image from the comic shows a T-Rex and Velociraptor, at least on the dinosaur side. Yeah, those are actually almost coexisted maybe kind of did been in different parts of the world yeah now the image from this movie trailer it looks like it's a velociraptor maybe it's a t-rex it was really hard for me to tell based on the angle and the lighting and everything (laughs) just (laughs) what exactly kind of dinosaur this was you don't have the perspective or something to scale it to know if it's tiny or huge yeah but it would be really cool to see more dinosaurs in these types of movies yeah Maybe they start off by battling and then they end as allies. Maybe. It's not a very common theme, but it would be nice to see that happen for once. Yeah, or you have (laughs) some dinosaur allies, some dinosaur enemies. I don't know. Mix it up. And after a quick ad break, we're going to go on to our interview with Rebecca Hunt Foster. And now on to our interview with Rebecca Hunt Foster. But of course, if you're a patron then make sure to check out your premium content feed for the extended version of this interview as well. We're joined this week by Rebecca Hunt Foster, who's the Monument Paleontologist and Museum Curator at Dinosaur National Monument. She does research on the Late Jurassic Morrison Formation, not surprisingly, the Late Cretaceous Mesa Verde Group, and the Early Mid-Cretaceous North American Ornithomimids. So now that you're the, uh, you know, main person at the Dinosaur National Monument, which is one of our favorite dinosaur places in the world, for sure, do you have any favorite things at the quarry or at the site? Yeah, at the quarry itself. 
itself, like the the actual Carnegie Quarry wall, of course, the two Camarasaur skulls are really cool. Just because, I mean, how often do you actually get sauropod skulls? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty, <laughs> uh, pretty neat. And I've had the opportunity to go up to the second one that's a little harder to see from the ground and actually be right there next to it. And it's a really, really cool specimen to see. So that's kind of like the Disneyland moment <laughs> of the quarry wall is all the sauropod skulls for sure. But then there are also all the little hidden things that you can't see. There's, you know, like a camp to soar jaw that you might not be able to notice from the mezzanine or the floor if you weren't specifically looking for it. There's a juvenile Allosaurus limb that's just folded up mm. and, you know, looks like the animal just decided to sit down and lose Ooh. the rest of his body. But <laughs> it's it's a very cool specimen. And that's, again, one of my favorites that are up there. Awesome. Is that a, a leg or an arm? A leg, I'm assuming? It's a leg. Oh, yeah, cool. it's, a, it's a leg. So it's cool because it has the... Both of the, you know, the upper leg, the lower leg, and then the whole foot and the little toenails are even kind of curled under. And it reminds me of, I have chickens, and it reminds me of some of my chickens when they're just kind of sitting down. <laughs> roosting or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. The roosting Allosaurus on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. We actually, one of our only replica fossils we have is of an Allosaurus hand that we bought at Dinosaur National Monument. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Years ago. Oh, it's cool. Yeah, it was so cool. I feel like we could spend you could spend so much time and find new things all the time just looking at that wall. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even when I'm up there, I see new things all the time. And I think that's part of the exciting part is, too, is that, I mean, you know, 1,500 fossils, there's a lot to see. So there's always something new. Yeah. And to our eyes, when we first saw it, there were a couple things we could see. I think Camarasaurus was the one that stood out because there's like a Mm -hmm. articulated neck or at least part of one with it. But the rest of it kind of to an untrained eye just looks like a giant jumble of random bones <laughs> all over the place. Absolutely. That's why it's cool when you have time to actually sit there and stare at it for a long time and and start to notice, oh, well, this part probably goes with that part. And there's a stegosaur plate and another one and another one. So that was probably one whole articulated animal at one point that just kind of got washed down the stream. Yeah. So I think that kind of stuff is a lot of fun when you have time to sit there and stare at it and puzzle it out. Yeah, that's so cool. Is there? Do you guys know like a minimum number of dinosaurs that are in that wall? So there's 10 different species that are represented on the wall. And I forget, you know, if they've got a good minimum number of actual individuals on the wall. <laughs> I'd have hard. to look that up. <laughs> but the cool thing that most people don't realize about the wall, too, though, is like, it's not just one event, it's multiple events that happened over time. Mm. So some of the animals you may be seeing, didn't live at the same time as some of the other ones. They're separated by a number of years, and and we don't even know how many years uh, currently. Mm. We don't really have the technology to completely tease that apart just yet. But it's kind of cool when you stare at it and realize, okay, well, that Camarasaur didn't live at the same time as that Camarasaur. <laughs> or, you know, that Barasaurus never would have met that Camptosaurus. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I, I had assumed either. it was like a, a mass burial, although that would be a ridiculous number of animals for one burial. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sad. Yeah. What's it like to, I guess, conserve and make sure all these bones are still in good shape? It's, you know, it's kind of heavy sometimes. <laughs> I'm because, sure. <laughs> you know, it's it's this massive responsibility to protect this thing into perpetuity so that everybody can always come and enjoy it. And when you're on the wall, I mean, there's always things that are, you know, they're they're exposed. They crack, they break down naturally. You know, when you're walking around on the wall, when we have researchers up there, we have to be very careful that we don't break anything. But sometimes the only place to step might be on a fossil. Mm-hmm. So you have to be careful about that as well. <laughs> the wall naturally has cracks running through it. And they used to try to repair those cracks, but then over time, the adhesive they would use to repair the crack with is actually stronger than the fossil itself. And so it would break again in another spot. So we aren't repairing those massive cracks anymore just because the wall has to naturally expand and contract Mm -hmm. seasonally. But we are monitoring those cracks to make sure that they're not widening or anything like that. Mm. So, yeah, it's it's a really um, interesting site to try to conserve and protect. And of course, you've got that crazy angle of the wall as well that also makes it a little more difficult. If it was flat lying, it'd probably be a lot easier. (laughs) But when you're at the angle that you are of that wall, things have a tendency to come down or roll. 
Yeah, you said it's like a wall, and I remember it being basically vertical, but then you also said you were walking on it. I'm trying to imagine how that works. <laughs> Do you have like a harness Carefully. situation? Well, the Cory wall is about a 65 degree wall, give or take. And so you can kind of walk around on it. And traditionally, people who have been working on the surface have just, you know, free, basically free climbed it <laughs> the whole time. There used to be a kind of like a, it was a lift. It was almost like a window washer unit that would mm. go up and down and could go horizontal and vertical. And that was removed when the building was renovated in the mid 2000s and it wasn't replaced. <laughs> so, um, so it's just kind of been a lot of free climbing until recently. Uh, our safety officer decided that this really wasn't very safe and he had some pretty big concerns about it. And so we have bought fall protection devices and harnesses and um, belay systems, all sorts Mm. of things. Mm -hmm. And we're working out a series of safety protocols so that we can actually be harnessed up when we're on the wall to make sure that there are never any accidents because we wouldn't want anybody to get hurt. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine if you're near like the bottom of the wall, but how tall is this wall? Oh, it's like two stories. So, <laughs> yeah, wow. You know, it's it's tall. Um, and if you have a problem with heights, it definitely like I've been up there with researchers before who kind of get up a little higher and freeze. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the key is just not looking down or behind you, of course. But mm-hmm. um, not everybody is comfortable with heights, and so it can be problematic. And it, you know, it definitely could be dangerous. So we don't want anybody to get hurt up there. Mm. There are even parts of the wall I haven't been to just because of safety reasons. But now that we have our harness and safety system, I'm looking forward to checking out some of those parts. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're going from combining both a outdoor hiking area. Now it's got the dinosaur wall and it's going to have like a rock climbing element (laughs) added to it. (laughs) Yeah, it it definitely is unique. I would say it's it's definitely interesting. It's a fun place to get to work. and, And of course, it's really exciting, too, that you're not just rock climbing, but you've got all these really cool fossils to look at. It's an added level of difficulty. Avoid the fossils while you rock climb. Mm-hmm. It's very <laughs> it's very distracting sometimes because you're like, oh, what's that? <laughs> Don't forget to hold on to the wall. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. Don't let go of the rope. So do you ever like take out new bones or is everything is the intention to keep everything like permanently exactly where it is? In the Cory Exhibit Hall building where the Carnegie Cory wall is exposed, the the goal is to leave everything in place. Hmm. That was always kind of the intention was to excavate many of the fossils, but to kind of pedestal them out and relief them so that people could see them in place. Because how many places Mm -hmm. can you go and actually see dinosaurs, you know, as they were preserved? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. So that was kind of the intention. And that was something that even Earl Douglas envisioned when he was working to have the monument set aside and protected. And so they excavated on the fossils pretty continuously from the mid 1950s until around the early to mid 1990s, excavating those fossils. And they got to a point where it was like, well, we've got a lot exposed and we're going to start you know, they started shifting their focus to other needs in the park. So we don't currently remove any of the fossils from within the Cory Exhibit Hall itself. If ever something was in danger of falling out or of, you know, being damaged, then of course we would remove it. But for the most part, everything is still there. And it's always fun to meet people who are bringing their like grandkids to the exhibit hall who have, you know, they visited when they were little kids. And it's cool to hear them saying, oh, I remember seeing that bone. And for them to know that it's still in place for them to be able to bring their grandkids to see too. And then those kids hopefully someday will bring their grandkids as well. So it's kind of neat to know that that stuff will always be there for people to enjoy. But the Carnegie Quarry isn't just what's inside the building. It extends outside of the building as well and a little bit to the east. And so those parts of the quarry wall we do still remove fossils from, especially if they're at risk from vandalization or mm. poaching or or just normal erosion and damage. So the most recent thing we removed was a stegosaur femur. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was like 30 feet up in the air and I had to excavate it from a cherry picker, which was <laughs> new for me. I had never excavated from a cherry picker before. So that was a new experience. That seems difficult. <laughs> um. It, it, you know, you had to be harnessed in and have safety equipment on and everything. So it was a little, yeah, 
yeah, it was a little <laughs> interesting. <laughs> I think the hardest part was when it came time to flip the jacket and roll it over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, luckily it was light enough that I could do it by myself. It would have been nice to have had two or three people on it. But there was nowhere to put two or three people. It was just <laughs> just room for me. And to be able to roll it out and basically catch it in my lap and then put it into the bucket and then realizing that there were like 20 people watching <laughs> from the windows it was a little intimidating. It was like, boy, am I glad I did not drop that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm sure it looked very easy to the crowd, but it was um, it was a little tense moment, but it came out beautifully and it's all prepared now and housed in our museum collections. And so, yeah, it was a fun specimen to get to work on. Well done. That sounds like a feat of strength, too, because those bones are not light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was probably about with the plaster and everything, probably around 50 pounds. Yeah, and super fragile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That was why we removed it. I don't think it would have made another winter. I think it would have definitely tumbled down the hill, which would have been awful. Do you have any other bones from that possible individual, I guess, or other stegosaurs from around there? Oh, there's tons of stegosaurs in the wall there. There's a several other bones. And of course, if we kept digging down, we would probably find a lot more. It's kind of a balance of time, money, space to house the material, all of that. And, and that's kind of the fun thing too about the, you know, the quarry sandstone, as we call it there in the Morrison Formation, is that we know the more we dig on it, the more we're going to find. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a point where it's like, well, how much do we dig and, and when do we stop? Yeah. And that's honestly just because, I mean, the layer's only so deep. So at some point you will have excavated the entire exposure that's exposed we do know that it still goes underground mm -hmm. um so we're not going to be digging down under the ground to get that just due to the angle that it's dipping under the ground um <laughs> paleontological <laughs> mining <laughs> exactly basically and that's kind of what the the Kernicki did when they were out here i mean they actually hired miners who oh, came geez. out and were mining this wall and using dynamite and you know uh special mining tools <laughs> to like drill holes in the wall and things like that. And then dropping down the mudstone that surrounded the area to where they could get to more of that sandstone. So yeah, it is basically paleontology mining, but we don't dig tunnels into the hills. Other paleontologists have done that in the past. Like Elmer Riggs did that to collect a patasaur down in the Grand Junction area. Wow. wow. So people have done this, but like digging tunnels is scary. I mean, that's asking for accidents. So we yeah. don't usually yeah. do that. Yeah, that's interesting. I think most people, including us, when we very first, you know, started learning about paleontology, you imagine like digging down into the earth because like, yeah, the, the bones are buried. They must be, you have to go down to get them just mm -hmm. like you go down to get anything else out of the earth. But really, it's, it's more they've, likely they've it's come up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, we like the surficial stuff. It's always, you know, a fun day when you find stuff that's easy to collect right there on the surface and always a little bit of a bummer when you find an animal that's plunging into, you know, a mountainside that has like <laughs> two or three hundred feet of rock above it. And you're like, well, that one's not coming out. <laughs> Someone will excavate it a few million years, maybe. <laughs> right. Exactly. Maybe something will happen or maybe they'll invent some new technology where we can just like burn through the rock around it yeah, but, yeah. You know, <laughs> probably not in my lifetime but uh, we still record these localities and, and hope that someone in the future will be able to have some fun cool do you store all of this stuff on site uh, at the national monument somewhere so the old Cory exhibit hall used to have the museum collections housed in it, but when that building was condemned and rebuilt, they did not build a new collections facility. So we currently do not have a collections facility for our material. So our material is currently being housed at the Utah Fieldhouse Museum of Natural History State Park located mm. in Vernal. Mm. They built a new collections facility in 2012, I believe. That's a very nice facility, very large, well lit, you know, nice and secure. It's a modern day collections facility. And so they were gracious enough to loan us some space. So we have got our collections currently housed there. Cool. Yeah, we I think we swung by that one. They have like an outdoor sculpture garden. I they do. Like. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That one's actually, Vernal is such a cool city because it's the so dinosaurs dinosaur everywhere. focused. Yeah, <laughs> there are. And, and after, with the during the pandemic, they actually spent a lot of money to paint murals everywhere. So oh, now cool. there are dinosaur murals all over town as well. Oh, fun. Awesome. 
<laughs> yeah, I feel like Vernal is like the American version of Drumheller in Canada. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It's, sometimes the climate feels the same as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> so I imagine you don't have a typical day. There's probably like tons of different no. things you're doing, but like what what is a day? An example of An a example day. An example of a day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can vary so much. I have three wonderful interns right now. So some days are spent in the museum collections with them, helping them with specimens. The people I'm hiring this summer, one will be doing field work and one will be developing curriculum for our Girl Scout camps that we run. Oh, nice. Cool. So we're excited. We usually try to do one or two of those a summer, and we're hoping to build up to doing more STEM-oriented too, not just paleontology-oriented, because I, I'm lucky enough to work with other really great female scientists here at the park, so they'll be sharing aspects of what they do as well, looking at the natural resources and the archaeology and things like that. So it's real exciting. That is awesome. Do you have your own patch? We do have our own patch. I'm so <laughs> excited. I cannot wait to get them made. Yeah. We hired a great artist out of Alaska, Raven, who has been developing art for us. So we have four patches that she's developed. Oh, I'm cool. We're wow. excited about that. So yeah, we're looking forward to getting those back on track. That is so great. That is. I went to some Girl Scout camps when I was a kid because my mom was a troop mom and I got a bunch yeah. of sisters <laughs> and we did not have any paleontology. So I'm super <laughs> jealous. <laughs> well, that's one reason we wanted to do it is that we live in such a great state for paleontology. And this is something that I started when I worked in Moab with these Girl Scout camps because girls don't always get the chance to be exposed to paleontology. And, you know, we have all these amazing fossils in this state that span all of geologic time that I really wanted to have the opportunity to, you know, introduce them to paleontology and help them be proud of, you know, what they have locally here in their own area. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's been really rewarding. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a Girl Scout mom too. I have my own Girl Scout troop and, and my <laughs> son goes to Girl Scout meetings as well. So <laughs> the tradition continues. It's <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> I mean, if, if he gets to go to a bunch of awesome paleontology stuff, I'm sure right. he's not complaining. <laughs> well, both of my kids get to go on a lot of different paleontology things. And I think they, they're they just reaching an age where they start realizing that it's not normal. They've been going on <laughs> digs since they were babies. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. A few years back, we were out collecting a brachiosaur humerus with some friends. And the people that came to help us extract it brought some Clydesdales. But they also brought their kids. And their kids were awesome. And my kids were thrilled to finally have other kids to play with on a dig <laughs> and not just have to be entertained by all the paleontologists who are more interested in the rocks than, than playing with trucks or something. <laughs> and so my daughter started working with the kids. They found a piece of bone next to us. And she's like, well, can we dig this up? And eh, it kind of looks scrappy. So we're like, sure, go for it. And so we're sitting there working on this beautiful humerus. And then before long, we realized it had gotten quiet and we turn around and she's leading her own little mini excavation right behind <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> us with all these kids. And she's showing them how to dig it up the right way. <laughs> We're like, oh my goodness, she's been paying attention this whole time. <laughs> she's actually been listening. And it was really great to watch them. They worked really well as a team and she showed them how to do all the steps very carefully. And it was a lot of fun. We could turn around because I mean, we were, they were literally right behind us and we could turn around and be like, Oh yeah, be careful with this little piece. And like, <laughs> they were on it. It was awesome. That, that is so is. great. They had their own little jacket that they extracted under our close supervision. But it was wonderful. So it's a lot of fun for it's a whole family affair for us. My husband's also a paleontologist. So we have a lot of fun doing it. That's great. That is so cool. Makes it easier to figure out the family trips. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just it's yeah, part of our life. We seldom have a vacation that doesn't revolve around fossils. <laughs> The first time we took our daughter to a museum that didn't have fossils, she was mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, where are the fossils? It was a train museum that we had taken our son to, and she was very upset. <laughs> there were no fossils. <laughs> and we realized that they had a very skewed sense of, of reality. Museum <laughs> means fossil. Mm -hmm. What is this? <laughs> yeah, and she was really upset. It was, it was kind of entertaining. <laughs> So switching gears a little bit, I know you've also identified a juvenile and two adult Taurosaurus utiensis from a bone bed in Texas. Yeah. 
That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. T- can you tell us about it? <laughs> yeah. So for my master's thesis, I was lucky enough to get to work in Big Bend National Park, which is an amazing park. If you've never been, you absolutely have to go. It's such a cool place and beautiful park, a varied terrain, but it was a geology park. It was kind of set aside to preserve this abundance of geology that that is exposed there. And lots of fossils have been found there over the years. And the fossil that I was able to work on was actually something that Juan Langston collected in the 1970s and had been at the University of Texas at Austin and their collections, but had never been um, formally written up or described. So I went back out to the site and reopened the site and excavated a little bit more to look for additional material. Didn't find a whole lot, but was able to describe the material that we had um, as Taurosaurus. Cool. And so Taurosaurus is related to Triceratops, but different. <laughs> um, I am in the Taurosaurus is not Triceratops camp. I was just um, about to ask. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I figured I knew where you, you stood. You can't say but... a juvenile Taurosaurus yeah. without raising eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, no. And these these were juvenile Taurosaurus. And so, yeah, it was fun to work on those. Taurosaurus Utahensis, of course, is a little lesser known than Taurosaurus latus, which is known from northern part of North America. And that's where you get the really, really big skulls. The Utah material that has been found is a little more scrappy, but the College of Eastern Utah or Utah State Eastern, I believe they call it now, is currently doing an excavation on a new Taurosaurus site in central Utah as well. So stay tuned for more information on Taurosaurus Utah hensis that will hopefully be coming out. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been waiting because, yeah, the debate seems to... It's definitely still going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's the fun part about paleontology is the debates. Yep. yep. So, yeah. <laughs> so circling back, you mentioned your chickens earlier. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of nice to think you, you, you've got dinosaurs at home. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and I know they were a big hit at SVP last year. Can you tell us about your chick? I know you've got multiple types of chickens, too. <laughs> you do. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. So, um I love birds and I love chickens and, and I would probably have an emu or I would really <laughs> like to have a cassowary, but oh, you know, you can't, you can't really have those in the backyard, especially when you have children running around. <laughs> um, and so we don't have any large flightless birds in the backyard, but we do have chickens and they're a lot of fun. And so we've had chickens for over a decade now. And yeah, I like to get all the different types of the different breeds. So we have, the silly Polish ones that look kind of like Big Bird with the poof on their head, <laughs> and silkies that have extra toes and have these beautiful, funny feathers. And then we just have your big old barnyard chickens. <laughs> we have we have all sorts. Of, I I really love chickens that have feathered feet. Mm-hmm. I find them to be just the coolest. <laughs> it really bothers some people, but I love looking at the feathers on their feet. They're just so interesting. Are the feathers different on the feet than on like the other parts of the body? No, they're, I mean, they're not like flying feathers, of Mm. course. They're just, they're for warmth, I guess. But they're, you know, an ornamentation, but they are really cool. They are still, you know, they have the middle, you know, the midline of the feather and then the other parts coming off of it from the center there. And so they look like the other feathers on the body, just smaller. Oh, cool. But they're so cool. (laughs) (laughs) And, And so it's, I love just spending you know, when I'm not in the field in the summer and the spring, I love to just be in the backyard in my garden and just watching my chickens and watching them hunt and peck and, and watching their their personalities play out and the, just the whole chicken drama <laughs> in the backyard. <laughs> it's, it's like a little chicken soap opera is back there. It's very entertaining and the pecking order and seeing where everybody falls out and but they're brutal at the same time, too. I've seen my chickens rip apart a mouse and eat it. Wow. Oof. Which is like, I mean, it, it reminds me just like of a Mark Hallett painting. It's just like, it's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, they're little theropods. They're a lot of fun. They're, um, they're really interesting to watch. For our listeners, then, where's the best place if they wanted to find out more about you and your work online? I do have a web page that I can send you all the link to if you, if you would like to share it. And I've um, put some information for the publications I have and and some of the little videos and stuff we've done for the quarry and for other sites we've worked at on there that people are welcome to watch if they're interested. And then of course they can go to 
nps.gov slash D-I-N-O to learn more about Dinosaur National Monument and all the awesome fossils that we have here. And we hope that people will come out to the monument for a visit sometime. And if you've been before, come back and see more things. Great. You also have a Twitter, right? I do have a Twitter. Yeah, I am a paleo chick on Twitter. It's a really good handle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So that's how you find me on Twitter. And yeah, it's always fun to be on Twitter and communicate with all the people who who love fossils. I feel like we've got a really great paleo contingent on there. And it's a wonderful mixture of everything from professionals to just really enthusiastic folks. And and everybody is always willing to answer questions. And I feel like it's so kind and, and accepting and and friendly to people. I, I really feel lucky to be in this tribe of amazing people. Yeah. yeah. Paleontology community is the best. Mm-hmm. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> We're not biased at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, we'll we'll have to make it back out to the quarry. Oh, definitely. Yeah, let us know. I hope we become one of those people with like gr- our grandkids and we yeah. talk, tell them about our first trip and then <laughs> <Yeah>. they <laughs> yeah. tell their grandkids. <laughs> Absolutely. And stay tuned for more, you know, science coming out of the park. We've got people working on everything from trilobites to dinosaurs. So there'll be more new things coming out beyond what we even find just in the Carnegie quarry. So it's an exciting time. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you all inviting me to talk to you today. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks again, Rebecca, for coming on and telling us all about the goings on at Dinosaur National Monument. It was really cool. I wish I could go and get some of those Girl Scout badges. (laughs) (laughs) Might have to make your own badges. Yeah. (laughs) And after a quick sponsor break, we're going to get into our Dinosaur of the Day, Guavasaurus. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Guaybasaurus, which was a request from Crow via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Guaybasaurus was a basal sauropodomorph that lived in the late Triassic in what is now Brazil in the Caturita Formation. See, I was able to talk about sauropods. Good. Or sauropodomorphs, anyway. Well, there has been debate, though, over whether Guaybasaurus was a basal sauropodomorph or a theropod, because it has characteristics of both. Hmm. It looked like an early theropod. It walked on two legs. It had short arms, also a long neck and tail, though, and a longish skull. It was estimated to be 6.6 feet or 2 meters long and weighed 22 pounds or 10 kilograms in 2016 by Gregory Paul. But then Molina, Perez, and Larmendi in 2020 estimated it to be 10 feet or 3 meters long and weigh 77 pounds or 35 kilograms. Much bigger. Yeah, usually things shrink over time with estimates. Mm Mm-hmm. The type species is Guaybasaurus candelariensis, and the fossils were found in an abandoned quarry. They included a well-preserved postcranial skeleton, no skull though, and a nearly complete left hind limb. The fossils were affected by weathering, so the neck and the skull they think probably eroded. Two more specimens were later referred to Guaybasaurus, including a nearly complete skeleton that was missing one forelimb, the feet, and neck, and there's a block not fully prepared yet with articulated fossils and a partial hand. Guaybasaurus was named in 1999 by Jose Bonaparte and others. The genus name means Gueba lizard, and it refers to the Rio Gueba hydrographic basin where the fossils were first found. They were collected as part of the Pro Gueba Project, a scientific program supporting research on Triassic fossils. The species name Candelariensis refers to Candelaria, a city near where the fossils were first found. There's one specimen found with its hind limbs tucked under its body and its forelimbs flexed to the side. The neck wasn't really preserved, but the vertebrae at the base of the neck curved to the left, so the neck may have been curved to the left as well. It's similar to a bird's resting position, like a chicken's. This has also been seen in other dinosaurs, such as the troodontid melong and the dinosauriform saltipus. Yeah, I always think of that as like a bipedal sort of position. Yeah. Although was, this probably was bipedal, I suppose, since it's so lightweight. Yes, it was bipedal. So they're thinking that this could mean that that resting position happened at the base of Theropoda or even the Sorischia clade. And it could be that that position helped to conserve body heat. Oh, yeah. You can imagine a cold wind coming by if you could get down on the ground, mm-hmm. and huddle up your limbs under you. Exactly. <laughs> 
Max Langer and others said that Guevasaurus had unique features in the pelvis, as well as some other features, such as the long caudal trunk vertebrae, which connects to the ribs. 24 vertebrae were found in the tail, but basal dinosaurs usually have 40 to 50 caudal vertebrae, so it's likely that those 24 vertebrae is only about half of its tail. Guebosaurus had some plesiomorphic or ancestral traits as well, and that may mean that even after other dinosaur clades were established, the more basal dinosaur morphs continued to do pretty well until the end of the Triassic. For a while, Guebosaurus was thought to be very similar and closely related to the sauropodomorph Saturnalia, and we covered Saturnalia as the dinosaur of the day in episode 369, if you want to go back and compare. A 2020 phylogenetic analysis by Rodrigo Tentmuller and Mauricio Silva Garcia found Guebosaurus to be a sauropodomorph and more closely related to Macrocolum and Unesaurus, which is why we're saying it's a sauropodomorph and not a theropod. But it's probably a saurischian, unless you go with Ornithoscolida. Maybe somehow this dinosaur could help with that debate. Maybe. Some other animals that lived around the same time and place as Guebosaurus include the sauropodomorph, Unisaurus, as well as pterosaurs, Silosaurids, and Rhynchosaurs. And our fun fact of the day is that super precocious birds can fly the same day they hatch. Super precocious birds. <laughs> Just super precocious. <laughs> But there are also some dinosaurs and archosaurs, non-dinosaur archosaurs, which could probably fly the same day they hatched, hmm. too. So precocious animals are those that are somewhat mobile or at least somewhat self-sufficient when they are born or they hatch. Basically, it means the same thing in scientific language as it does in common English usage for a unusually mature kid. Human like, kid. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I guess you could use it for other animals, too. Goats? Like, that's a precocious dog. Mm. You might be able to say that. I don't know. Well, I was thinking kid goats. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. true, too. <laughs> However, precocious animals still often need some parental care. So, for example, pretty much all mammals are going to need milk from their mothers. Horses and other ungulates, even though they need milk from their mothers, are still considered precocial, though, because they can walk on their own and sort of keep up with groups of animals. They don't need to be carried around, for example. They can also see where they're going. Ducks still follow their mothers or sometimes other animals that are around them when they hatch. Whatever they imprint on. Yep. And even though they still need their mother and they need to follow the mother duck around in order to learn what to eat, and also get some protection, they're considered precocial because they can do that following. They also usually fly off within a couple months, but that's not fast enough to be considered super precocial. Altricial is the opposite end of the spectrum. Those animals are pretty useless when they're born. Merriam-Webster <laughs> defines it as hatched or born in a very immature and helpless condition so as to require care for some time. Oh, <laughs> Like humans? <laughs> yeah, humans. Well, humans are weird, but yeah, pretty much humans. With animals, they often don't open their eyes much. They can't really move on their own at all. And they don't have much hair or feathers for insulation. So they often need to be warmed up. And they need to have food brought to them. So pretty much the opposite of super precocial. It includes humans, dogs, cats, and most birds, for example, owls, hawks, and most songbirds are considered altricial. But we shouldn't feel too bad about being altricial. We're not as vulnerable as some animals are. For example, we generally have hearing and some eyesight, and we can regulate our body temperatures. All pluses. Yes, that cannot be said of cats. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize for cats. Cats even don't know when to urinate unless they get stimulated to do so. Huh. They're very helpless. And some birds also are missing a lot of these abilities when they're born. The big advantage for being altricial, though, is that we get a lot of time to learn from our parents. And obviously, you can learn a ton of different things, whether it's language or hunting or what to eat, like with ducks. There's so many different things that that opens up opportunities for. It also helps that we get supplied with a very steady food supply, which is good for our development. So being altricial, has, you know, there's pros and cons to the different development styles. There always are. Yes. Super precocious animals 
are ready to go out on their own before they need even their first meal. For example, megapodes, aka mound builders or incubator birds, are famous examples of super precocial animals. Some species of megapodes are called brush turkeys. They look basically like a cross between a chicken and a turkey. They don't have an egg tooth. None of the megapodes do. So instead, they have to kick their way out of their egg with their claws. And then they have to dig their way out of the mound that they're buried in for incubation. Since they have wings that are covered in feathers, they have to tunnel using their feet. So they kind of lie down and then they kick and tunnel in a really awkward way. So that's quite an introduction to the world. You got to kick your way out of an egg and then tunnel out using only your feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to escape. <laughs> it's the first thing you do in life. They're also born fully fledged, which literally means that they have their full set of flight feathers. They are ready to go. Yeah, yeah. And they can fly on the same day that they hatch. <laughs> it's useful because their parents don't stick around. We're actually still not entirely sure how they recognize their own species because when they hatch, there's nobody around to Oh, and recognize. adults look very different from chicks. Yeah, and they can't, well, they can't see themselves. They don't have a mirror to look in or anything. Yeah. They, the presumption is that they sort of recognize instinctively either some details of the appearance or maybe the movement or smell or something. In addition to megapodes, it seems that enantiornithines, the weird toothed bird dinosaurs, which went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, were also born fully fledged and were probably super precocious based on fossil evidence. Mm-hmm. Pterosaurs may have also been super precocious. Hmm. And considering the similarities between megapodes and sauropods, meaning that they're buried and sort of not necessarily taken care of by the parents, you know, they might have just sort of been left in their nest. Sauropods may have also been super precocious, but that is much harder to determine from the fossil record since sauropods don't fly. <laughs> and a lot of this evidence is based on when they get those big flight feathers. How cool would it be if we found out there was a flying sauropod? Yeah, that would be cool. Very unlikely, but it would be cool. It would be cool. I'm not sure why we think that pterosaurs are super precocious. I just found a couple references to that. But since we're all about dinosaurs, I didn't look too deep into it. Mm -hmm. Considering the wide diversity of birds, they go they range from super precocious to altricial for quite a while. Dinosaurs probably range that full spectrum as well some needing a ton of parental care. We often say tyrannosaurs and other carnivores likely did that, just like how hawks and owls today teach their young how to hunt and also supply them with meat when they're young, whereas some of the herbivorous birds and dinosaurs may have been more precocial. But that's not always the case because those passerines, a lot of them just eat nuts and fruit and stuff, and they still are altricial. Interesting. Well, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you want to dive deeper into any of the topics we discuss, head over to our website, inodino.com. We'll have links to all the sources in the show notes. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.